Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, my name is Charo Neville. I'm the curator of the gallery here, uh, for those of you who don't know me. Um, this truly is amazing for us. Um, not only to have guests, a group of people in here to uh, celebrate the opening of our new exhibitions, but also to have all the artists in attendance, um, some of whom have come from Toronto to be here. So, um, and the sky's cleared for us too. Hooray! <laughs> um, I, I have some notes um, as a way of uh, talking about how I came to this exhibition and, and also um, very broad strokes, pun intended, uh, <laughs> for uh, painting, the, the history of painting. <laughs> it will be brief. Um, just as a way of thinking of um, painting today. So uh, this is the work of five leading Canadian artists, some of whom would call themselves painters, um, some who wouldn't consider themselves just painters, but uh, Canadian women artists. Uh, and they are from different cultural backgrounds, um, different stages in their careers. Um, and based, as I said, in um, kind of opposite ends of the country, in central and in western Canada. Um, so this is my way of looking at a, a renewed perspective of a historically male-dominated genre of art. Um, and it's really an exhibition that's motivated by my interest in what painting in Canada is today, a slice of that anyway. Um, so as you know, painting is a long venerated medium um, and really has been in the Western canon of art history revered as the highest art form. Um, and, and so when you look at a survey of art, you'll, you'll get all, all the, the masters who are typically male, which is, you know, reflects um, society in some ways, but it's also um, good to remember that painting wasn't invented by Europeans. <laughs> um, so also within painting, there is historically a hierarchy. Um, so you think of the Paris salon, and the salon style hanging of paintings, and um, even there uh, through the art academies, there would be um, a hierarchy of the, the history paintings would be at, to at the top of kind of like the most refined, most important paintings. Um, and then you would have portraiture or genre painting would come next, which is like everyday life, um, landscapes, and then still lifes at the bottom. Um, and I would say painting in Canada has really been uh, marked by its regionalism. So in early Canadian painting, settlers, uh, settler artists came to Canada and um, their artwork was really tied to European tradition um, and colonial narratives, of course. Um, so they were artists who were new to Canada and steeped in these Western art academies and uh, they carried this to the so-called New World um, of New France and British North America. And, uh, of course, in the early 1900s, the group of seven, who were all male painters, um, set out to create definitively Canadian paintings with a distinct visual language and an approach to landscape painting primarily um, that I would say still comes to represent a high point in Canadian art to many. Um, and then jump ahead to the 1950s, the emergence of abstraction meant that painting uh, no longer had to compete with the photographic image or lived experience and uh, through representation. So um, it really liberated the medium. And I would say also in Canada, you can trace it to regional movements or groups. So you think of the automatiste in Quebec or Painters 11 in Ontario, the Regina Five in the Prairies, and then West Coast Modernism. 
Um, yesterday when I was giving the staff tour, I forgot about the death of painting. I didn't flip my page. <laughs> so, um, in 1967, uh, with Canada's centenary celebrations at the World's Fair, um, painting was unceremoniously declared dead by the art critics. Um, new media and technology and multidisciplinary approaches to art were um, coming to the fore and painting was no longer as relevant. Um, and then... In 1981, famously, uh, critic Douglas Crimp wrote a seminal essay uh, published in October magazine called The End of Painting. Um, so painting has really, um, if, if you follow the, the art history of it, has experienced many rebirths and deaths. Um, and I would say that um, my research is telling me that we're experiencing another rebirth or a vitalization or, or s s painting is vital in Canada right now. Um, so it was, it was a big task to, um, for me to think about how to make a painting show here. Um, and so if, uh, back to the, the regionalism of painting um, since the 1970s in Vancouver, which is the context that I studied in and was surrounded in um, as I was emerging in my career, um, photo conceptualism was really uh, came to define contemporary art. So you think of art stars like Jeff Wall or Rodney Graham, although Rodney Graham is now painting, it seems. He's back to painting. <laughs> Um, so, but at the same time, there, um, across Canada and um, in central and eastern Canada, um, there's been a strong focus on painting, and um, I would say that that's supported by art schools like NASCAD or um, Guelph, um, and the faculty of painting um, have have really been um, teaching young students about painting, um, but less so in Vancouver. So as a curator, uh, a lot of what I do, especially being so removed from urban centers, is that I look to other exhibitions. Um, and I was actually working at the uh, Vancouver Art Gallery at the time that um, the paint exhibition um, showed, and it was curated by artist Neil Campbell. Um, and he put forward this idea of a renewed interest at the time in painting and argued for the vitality of paint in Western Canada. Um, and there's a great quote by then uh, Vancouver Art Gallery Chief Curator, Associate Director, Dinah Agaitis, who stated, people keep trying to pound the last nail in painting's coffin, but it keeps emerging with greater vigor, enthusiasm, and fervor. I think it is so deeply ingrained in art history that it will never go away. I love that quote. Uh, so the VAG followed up in 2017, 10 years after the paint show, with an exhibition called Entangled, Two Views on Contemporary Canadian Painting. And this was examining the status of painting again um, by really positioning uh, making uh, and ideas. So painting that really was about the material and then a painting that was about uh, conceptual strategies. Um, so I was thinking about these approaches and I thought, well, it would be a trap uh, if I were to put on a survey exhibition <laughs> uh, because you start, it's uh, like when you are trying to remember to thank everybody in a speech and then you leave somebody out. It's <laughs> and I know for the Entangled exhibition, um, it was intended to be a much smaller exhibition than, um, you know, more, more people started um, being involved, um, and, and so I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to try to say what painting is today in, in a way that was um, like a concise, uh, definitive statement, um, and, or, or a binary either, like pitting, pitting materiality against um, ideas. Um, so you'll see in this exhibition that um, you'll see both. Um, coming to the surface. Um, another thing I wanted to mention too, an exhibition that's opening next Friday, 
that Rajni Perer is in um, at the Esker Foundation um, is called Relations, Diaspora, and Painting. Um, so also, um, I'm, I'm hoping that with these kind of exhibitions that there is, the, I'm seeing a notable shift um, towards um, less of a Western view in relation to painting. So with this exhibition, um, the framework is somewhat experimental. I would say it's also intuitive. Um, my research kind of landed on these five artists and it's um, uh, bringing them together. Um, and I, you know, over the last week, three of them have been here working and um, negotiating space together. And also um, like Chris and Amy's work, it's, it's mostly new work. So it's experimental for them too. Um, and it's also just a, as a whole, um, an experiment in creating kind of relational connections between the works and the artists. Um, and I would say that as a whole too, that it's about the expanded possibilities of what a painting can be. Um, so you'll see that uh, each of these artists, as I mentioned, has more of an interdisciplinary practice. So they also draw, they mix objects. Um, and you'll also see a lot of fabric in the work, um, a lot of different mediums actually. Um, and with all the associations that fabric, have, fabric has too with the idea of labor and um, gendered references as well. So I was thinking about all of that in, in the selection. Um, and uh, the labor also in uh, really became apparent for me in the long hours that these artists uh, worked here, especially Rasna, some midnight hours. <laughs> um, and so that's, you know, we, we get to enjoy their labor. Um, and I would say generally also that the work is largely abstract, um, but the figure appears throughout too. I just, I, you'll, you'll start seeing it emerging directly or indirectly. Um, in most of the work. Um, so I'll just close too by explaining the title, um, which relates to my observation of this, this sort of bodily presence in all of the practices. Um, and it's actually borrowed from Lise's, uh, a quote that I found where she's talking about, I think in part the connection between um, painting, drawing and sculpture and needing to hold the line in her hand. So uh, thank you for that. <laughs> and I'm going to pass it on. Um, as I said, we have the artists here. So they're each going to speak um, in the order of the booklet that you have, too, so you can kind of follow along as they go. Hi. I did notes today because I realized when I gave the talk yesterday that I should have done notes. <laughs> so um, and it's been a long time giving a talk in person. It's been a long while since the last time I did it. Um, okay, so where can I start? I came from Colombo, Sri Lanka. Uh, I was born in like a super uh, kind of a outskirts of Colombo city. And then we went through, I lived in Australia for a while. And then we went to New York State and then ended up in between Jane and Finch in Scarborough in Ontario. Um, my parents are still in Scarborough to this day. And uh, yeah, I came here when I was like eight and a half. I remember turning 10 here, having a 10th birthday in, here in Canada. And um, yeah, I went to OCAD University, um, which is in Toronto. Uh, I was extremely uh, not disappointed. I mean, I didn't know, know what to expect going in in terms of a curriculum uh, as Because I lived between North York and Scarborough I assumed that the curriculum would not be so Eurocentric as it was of course because this seemed to be a city that was run and created Not run by immigrants, but definitely its culture coming from immigrants. That's what surrounded me and going into art school and discovering this is very much not the case feeling out of place and at the end of the day, having to actually construct my own curriculum, kind of. Um, I was fighting the deans. I didn't understand why African art and Indian art were together in the same course. It was, and I was like, that is, you know, 
tens of thousands of years of the history of two subcontinents. No way. Can you cover that in an hour and a half twice a week, man? There's no way that's happening. So that was my problem going into school, and I started to, you know, reconstruct a curriculum for myself, and I actually plan to continue that, you know, if I get, get into or create the master's program that I want to create. I, am, I still have only an undergrad. So uh, school scared me that much, folks, that much. So, um, so that was me in art school. Um, and then when I graduated from school, I was, you know, I think six months pregnant. I went right into my first solo show in about a month and a half. I was like a boat. I had to install the whole thing myself. That It did not go, I mean, the sales were, interest was good in the show, but it didn't go well with the gallery. So, you know, after that, I had a little baby that was strapped to me and, and uh, I was working you know, as much as I could. Um, I'm a single parent now, which has its different set of challenges, but at the time, you know, I was really making do, we were very poor, and uh, I was making do with what was around me um, to make my work. And then, you know, after you kind of wade through all of the cliche uh, identity-based work that you're gonna make as an immigrant in a white institution, I went back to my first love, which was science fiction, always, like since I was four, five years old. Uh, in Sri Lanka, we had, we got a whole bunch of Japanese programming. One of those programs was Robotech, which turned out to be a joint American and Japanese studio collaboration. And um, many other shows, the original Astro Boy, of course, we got some comics. I got my hands on an Osamu Tetsuka when I was very young. I didn't understand a lot of it. He's the, of course, the forefather of manga as we know today. So, you know, that line of, of loving science fiction in all of its forms, I was reading it, I was watching it, I was thinking about it. That line followed me all the way across the sea and across many borders. And, and it, it, you know, it's something that, you know, gave me a hug and made me feel better when times were hard, which is a lot of the time. Um, and uh, it's something that, you know, came back into my work only like five or six y years after I graduated school. The reason science fiction resonated so deeply for me and it's in my work and the way the reason it's alive in my work today the way it is is because uh, for me science fiction it's not just a subgenre you know science fiction is a window it shows you futures and realities when you're left out of that as a race of people or as a non-white person you're left out of those futures and realities all of that stuff that could exist potentially so I decided to to you know to include science fiction its aesthetics, its hopefulness, and everything else that it has to offer, uh, include it in my investigation of, of sort of diasporic theory. And they, it comes out in, in very strange, some very strange ways. Uh, but um, that's the place of science fiction in my work. And that science fiction is at the heart of my work as an immigrant and as somebody who wants to keep on um, exploring and investigating the trajectory of marginalized peoples. Um, in in a, in a uh, Western in a European colony that is Canada. So so um, I'll talk about my work briefly. How am I doing for time? I think I'm all right. I'll just go through the works. Yeah, yeah great, awesome. Um, I didn't know about if my practice talk was too short or too long. So I'm just trying to like get in the somewhere in the median of that. Um, I'll start with those. So those three on the wall there are called dancers. Dancers is the body of work that I, that I started um, after, uh, considering the, after considering the potential of, of dance as a way to explore body dynamics, uh, diasporic theory, and the aesthetics of science fiction in one swoop. And I started painting these dancing figures. The choreography stills that I draw upon mostly come from people of color owned and run dance studios throughout North America. Alvin Ailey Dance Company is one of my favorites. And uh, so starting to draw upon those and, and creating these mute, sort of mutated, changing figures um, that are happening sort of right in front of you. And then, and then uh, having the palette uh, mirror um, the colors of space travel. So 
and you know the colors of space travel. A lot of it comes to us from from you know the concept art that people put forward for for science fiction movies to happen. To be honest, right? We don't have cutting edge, incredible cameras on the side of the you know whatever shuttle is going up to join the space station anymore. Now it's science missions, right? It's not here for our entertainment so much any longer. So. So trying to put all those things together and then you'll see adornment that goes through the figures as well. And um, I, adornment and jewelry uh, come up, at, show up in my work as a form of, of armor and a shield. Um, of course, you know, wherever you come from, the, uh, you'll take a piece of that with you to protect you. In, and in, in the households that I was living in and around, um, jewelry and your adornments were things that you took with you and you kept and kept with you that keep you safe when you don't kind of know who you are anymore. As an immigrant or marginalized person, not really knowing who you are at times in your life is super, super common when you don't have really roots, when you've uprooted yourself or have had to, right? So, so that's the story of dancers. The one behind you guys is um, not waiting and that's one of the, that's a small piece. I don't get to do small work anymore. I love this. Piece. Um, I can't wait until I do small work again. Honestly, that and these might be the last small works that I did, like two, two, three years ago. I don't, because now everybody wants big work, like just like Chero, she just wants big work. Yeah. So, so and that's a, a small uh, kind of a study of a woman who's getting up. It's called not waiting, getting up to leave. Um, these ones that you see on this really beautiful circular plinth that Matthew, uh, the installer, built. Um, they're called uh, positive forms, and uh, they're further investigations uh, into the aesthetics of science fiction. I became really, you know, I, in school, science fiction was treated as such a subgenre that I was like really adamant to bring it into the mainstream of fine art. I was like, no, no, it belongs, because science fiction affects everybody. It shows all of us the better world that we can build. So, you know, it's another investigation into that. This new piece is called Protectors. And this has a, um, a slightly, uh, a story that I'm still trying to figure out, to be honest. And um, it, this is a sketch and an idea that I came up with after getting lots of news about Kamloops and everything that's going on here right now. I mean, you know, I feel like I, ha I still haven't had the time to really process from being here how Kamloops is an epicenter of Canadian colonial and climate issues. It really, really is, right? I still, I'm still confused about how I feel about being here. It's stunning, it's tragic, it's interesting. I don't, I need to spend more time here in the future to really wrap my mind around this place and also the potential and opportunity for, for you know, for a gover governing bodies to make to make huge striding se strides and setting examples for for how land and environmental and indigenous issues can be resolved and dealt with there's an opportunity here to do it right so i feel also that way about it i don't know if that's misled i'm just learning so that's that's sort of the story behind this piece this is a you know i paint a lot of of metaphysical world figures that and hyperdimensional figures that may exist now, or they barely exist, or they're in another place completely, but they mirror what is happening here. So these are three figures that are um, asking for forgiveness or understanding or a second chance from environmental forces that govern them. So if you'll see the pleading stance, but these of course come from dance choreography too, but I'll, I see lots of feeling and I see lots of dynamism emotionally in dance, right? So I pull from that to get it to say things. Um, and that's the story of, of Protectors. That's the story of this piece. Um, yeah, I think that's it. That's all I've got. Thank you guys very much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Rasna Kaur, and I am originally from Brampton, Ontario. And I moved to Vancouver about four years ago. And um, I moved to do my MFA at Emily Carr. Uh, I don't have a BFA, I have a BA that I got from the University of Waterloo. And I actually started off in the science program and then kind of halfway through the program switched into fine art. 
Um, but since graduating from my MFA in 2019, I now live and work in uh, Vancouver, and I teach at Emily Carr in the painting department and also kind of show my work around. Um, I guess in general, uh, a lot of my practice or the inspiration behind my practice comes from spaces of overstimulation. So spaces like amusement parks and festivals and uh, ceremonies. I grew up in the wedding industry and my mom for many years, she's retired now, but she used to design Indian bridal wear. So I kind of grew up around lots of textures and colors and textiles, combining textures to create movement um, and, you know, incorporating kind of odd color palettes uh, within the Punjabi community specifically, there's no such thing, I believe there's no such thing as a neutral color, kind of everything goes. And it, it's interesting because when you look at some of these patterns and color separately, they don't exactly look as if they would work together until they're in close proximity or layered on top of one another and then it kind of just works for some reason. Um, but I look to a lot of these spaces, even religious spaces, you know, I grew up in a Sikh Punjabi household, so we went to the Gurdwara, and then I also attended a kind of very small conservative Christian school, so kind of spent lots of times in and out of churches, and then later on in life, my parents became very spiritual, so kind of pulling from all of these uh, various religions and faiths and beliefs, and so... I became very fascinated with these spaces, and for me, walking through these spaces, I felt almost as if I, I had this kind of temporary relief from, you know, everyday responsibilities and burdens. And I became interested in what is the difference between being inside these spaces and outside of these spaces, because often it's a doorway or a gate that's separating the two spaces or experiences. So then I started thinking about the colors that I see in these spaces and the sounds and the smells and um, the kind of over-the-topness of it all. And if I think about, um, you know, walking out of these spaces and all of the sudden, you know, your shed of all of this kind of overstimulation and you're brought back kind of down to earth and down to your, your everyday life. And so when I think about painting or the painted surface and how I can bring these experiences to painting, it often also reminds me of like this uh, illusion of joy that you experience or that you uh, experience in these spaces. And, you know, I can recall kind of walking up to these beautifully painted buildings or these um, like facades that are created. And when you get up close to these painted buildings, specifically in amusement parks, you kind of walk up to them, you look inside the windows, and they're empty. And so when I think about what a painting is, and what happens if I were to, you know, lift this painting off of the wall, you realize that, you know, a painting in a way can also be an illusion. Like we're kind of meant to believe that the surfaces contain this space, but really, you know, it's a there's nothing really to it, right? They're empty, they're just surfaces. And so, most recently, I've been thinking about, also in terms of overstimulating spaces, kind of spaces or your everyday life and kind of things that we keep around us, objects that we surround ourselves with, colors. And I think about, you know, most recently, this time of kind of isolation and being surrounded in your own space and thinking about the objects that we surround ourselves as sources of inspiration and things that we can bring into our work. And so for me, uh, I think about, you know, these objects containing clues to who you are as a person and as an artist and kind of making these mundane everyday objects something uh, of importance and kind of over the top and kind of amplifying them and bringing them into the work. And so, um, you know, some of this is still very new to me. This is the first time I've actually incorporated some sort of representational elements or things that you can see in real life into the work. 
Um, but another large part of the work is um, kind of working in this modular fashion. So I work with lots of small surfaces that come together to compose larger compositions. And this way of working started off in my MFA program because I knew going into the program that I wanted to work quite large and that was very important to me. But the studio space was actually quite small. So it started off as a logistics thing, but then became a very important part of my practice in that, you know, I, I never really wanted my paintings to feel fixed or permanent because uh, my trajectory or my path to painting was anything but straightforward. So I felt that um, for me to continue exploring and to really understand what painting, how I can think through certain experiences, um, with the modular way of working, you can have the paintings expand, they can shrink. Several times during the process, uh, these panels kind of get turned upside down. Um, often I begin a painting in a small section. So for example, this piece here, if you look at the top right hand corner, it's uh, this green velvet fabric that started off really tiny and then slowly kind of grew to become this larger surface. And that goes for pretty much all of the work in this show. Um, another part of my process is working in the kind of digital Realm. And so, especially when you're working at a larger scale, it's kind of difficult to see how everything comes together. So working digitally allows me to kind of plan a little bit, but then also approach the surfaces spontaneously. Um, but if I'm thinking about the extension, the paintings on the wall, which are pretty much in all of the work that I've included here, I think about when I'm working digitally and I'm working on a specific file, if I were to zoom out of that file, all of a the sudden, these shapes and forms that go on beyond the surface are made visible. And so when I think about a painting on a wall, and I think, okay, well, what happens when I zoom out of that painting? And then I see the wall elements. And then what happens if I zoom out of the wall again? Like, what else exists beyond what we can see? And so in a way, it's kind of making the invisible visible. And that's also one of the things that I'm trying to do with bringing in these elements from real life is thinking about what makes up our identity. And often the conversation around identity has to do with race and ethnicity. And you know that is definitely one part of our identity and maybe it's a very important part of our identity, but it's the most kind of obvious. You can kind of look at someone and maybe even assume certain things. But with um, other kind of unexplainable or everyday or funny, sad, random life experiences, those are not necessarily visible. And so, but they're definitely a part of who we are and they kind of, um, you know, they impact how we move through life. And for me, they also impact how I approach my materials and surfaces. Um, I have my notes here too. The other thing that I wanted to touch upon was my use of color. And so, Often in my work, I use lots of bright, bold colors, and I sometimes get the reading, or when others talk to me about my work, they bring up the fact that um, these bold colors often, you know, give this feeling of joy, and, you know, there are very happy and joyful colors, but I also think in a way that's a simple reading of color, and color can be a little bit more complex than that. And I think to my experiences working with my mom in her studio and think about how, you know, women would always come in and desiring all of the color on one outfit. The more color you can get on one piece of fabric, the more beautiful it is considered to be. And so, you know, since moving away from Toronto, whenever I'm back, you know, the family time becomes uh, very precious. And so when I have conversations with the women in my family, and um, you know, specifically my, my grandmother and my mom and my aunts, you kind of talk to them and you hear their stories and you know, how they got to the point that they are today. And you start to understand that there's actually quite a bit of hardship and challenges and things that they've never spoken about and they just kept inside all these years. And you know, it really affects how they go through life and it affects future generations because that you know, trauma or those challenges that are never spoken about get passed on. And so then I start to question, well, what does it mean 
when we desire so much color or we adorn ourselves with so much color. And in that sense, bright colors or bold colors, for me, take on another meaning and actually become a way that maybe we can distract from or um, deflect and maybe it's a way we protect ourselves from what's going on beneath all of these layers of colors. So that is also something that I'm thinking about in, in the paintings that I create. Um, the titles of the works in the show and also some of the text that you see in this piece come from a process of creating uh, redacted poetry. And so this is something that I started doing a couple years ago, but just recently started to incorporate into my work. And it's essentially taking a pre-existing text, so I often use old novels or old science textbooks, and you kind of eliminate to reveal something new. And sometimes I think, you know, that is a process that's more kind of it opens up what text can be for me. And in that way, I kind of treat text as another way of mark making or, you know, just as I'm experimental with some of my materials, I'd like to make sure that experimentation is kind of carrying through in this text. So I basically rearrange and, you know, flip and eliminate the text to create some of the uh, titles that you will see in the booklet. Um, Installation is another thing that I experiment quite a bit with. The work that you see in the first room, the paintings are displayed on a corner. When the initial uh, exhibition of that work, the pieces were separate. And uh, you know the, the wall paintings also change depending on the site at which uh, the works are being exhibited. And I'm trying to think of what else I would like to say. How am I doing on time, Charo? Good? Oh, okay, all right. Well, if anyone has any questions about the work, I, I'd love to chat some more, but thank you for listening. <laughs> Hi, I'm visiting here from Kathit. It's uh, northern Sunshine Coast on the uh, Tulam traditional Tulaman um, territory. I've uh, lived up there for about almost four years now, um, so it's been a new experience in my life uh, living rural, living like in very close proximity to um, in the woods near the coast. Um, and yeah, I feel really grateful for th that experience and I'm learning a lot. The last few years has been, um, yeah, like really uh, in a place of openness, learning. And uh, this last year especially, um, listening has become um, very like essential. Uh, this work that I'm showing here, uh, I began some small studies in the winter um, that these four paintings um, were made from. They were a series of 12 small works that all were with a, beginning with the question of what is essential and thinking a lot about centers and edges um, and how the work needed to relate to each other, but also that it needed to bring, each piece needed to bring something new um, to expand on. And working um, through that, I selected four works that I amplified for this exhibition. Um, the, this work is called Fading Pathways, and the center work is To Grow and to Shrink, and the work, the green work is Breaking Waves, and the piece around the corner there is Full of Limited Potential. Um, these works ended up, because of their, the reduction and the simplicity um, of color, of shape and of line, uh, there were a lot of uh, essential elements that started appearing, like air, wind, fire, earth. And these are things that I've been thinking a lot about, learning a lot about, and um, 
this week, <laughs> they've been especially prominent. Um, there's a different kind of vulnerability that you experience when you are living remotely within these elements. And I've been, um, one thing that I really appreciate about my experience working with art is the way that it teaches you basic skills of observation. Um, in the beginning of your practice, you, you learn that when you're looking at something and representing it, often the first way that you represent something is a bit of an exaggeration of what it is that you're seeing and that you slowly learn how to see what's there. But I also really thrive on the solitude of this experience, um, of having the privilege to spend that time with myself, with my work in nature, with my partner, and to engage with a new community has been really uplifting and exciting. The resourcefulness of the people and the support of the people that we've been around has been really generative as well. And this work, I made it in 2019. Um, the title is called, it's Holding Space for a Break. I've been thinking with a lot of this work about meditation. I don't have a meditation practice. When I, when I work, it feels like meditation. And in thinking about meditation, I really wonder, um, there's this element of emptying your mind but also to meditate on something, to be thinking about something. And what I'm, I guess, looking for through both of those practices is the ability to be grounded in the present and to be able to um, be in some peace with that within yourself, but also trying to make sense of the world around you. Um, I think it's a really exciting time. I think there's a lot of new ways of speaking about things that have been ever present. I think there's a lot of new space to speak about issues of colonialism and capitalism that are not really working for everybody. And that is a lot of what I think about when I'm working in my practice. And, what I'm listening to, and just the very act of sewing uh, makes me think a lot about labor and value and the gratitude I have for my labor and expression having value, but also the reality that a lot of people who work this way for a living don't have that value. Um, and the work, um, on this far wall here is called what what is a body and there's gestures of mending um, there's mending of what's obvious on the surface but then I think there's also this implication that there are things that we can't see um, that need care and I think with a lot of work there's a lot of maintenance that I've become very aware of living rurally, but even just within your own practice. I've been thinking a lot about how do you convince a body to move? A lot of questions um, that just continually run through my mind as I'm, as I'm working in the studio. So I, I suppose like, that has been what I've been meditating on, but the work is also open for anyone to bring whatever they're meditating on. And what I hope for with this openness and abstraction is the encouragement to have the confidence of reading the work that you are getting what it is, and there really is nothing more there. Thank you. 
I'm also going to read because it's been a long time since I've done this. Yesterday was a run through, but not really for me. Um, I want to take this opportunity actually to thank Charo and Margaret and the whole team here who have been unbelievable in bringing us all together. Did it just go on? Oh. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. The works that Cheryl selected for this exhibition are selected works, so they're from 2016 and 2017. Those would be the works in that corner over there. And the rest of the work was done during the pandemic in 2020 and 2021. So the smaller works are actually selections from the last six months approximately. Um, when you enter this section over here to your left, um, there are five fabric works. The rest are all on canvas. They're acrylic and flash and paint on canvas. And two are from the 2016 series called Crying Hair. And the other three are from uh, a series that I've titled Tall Collars. So the Crying Hair series are on canvas and they're shaped and cut pieces of found fabric and wool felt a material that I work with a lot. Usually it's black and it's very dense. And um, the tall collars are made from shirt collars and shirt plackets and shirt cuffs and found fabric and, on, and sewn and glued onto um, canvas. One of the things that comes up regularly and has for many decades now um, in my work is the shape of the school uniform. In French, it's called a tunic. It's the school uniform, which is ba basically a very simple shape. It's this kind of shape. It's a square, basically, with a square in it. It's a uniform. Um, in French, it's called un, a tunic, un tunic. And um, it has stayed with me. It's something I wore when I was in private, not private, in public school in Ottawa, Francophone public schools. Francophones had public schools in Ottawa. And I wore them in the 60s and 70s. And for some reason, that image and that shape has haunted me for most of my life. So it's quite a long time now. <laughs> and it has it recurs and will show up again and again, both formally and figuratively and, um, and through intention in a lot of the work. And sometimes it's preempted by figures and sometimes it's hidden by figures and sometimes it transforms into dresses and sometimes it transforms into body parts. So a lot of the work that is at the end is more abstracted forms of the tunic and sometimes the body, whereas some of the works that you see behind me, um, actually I kind of skipped a part. Let me go back a little bit. During the pandemic, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, our studio where I work was shut down for uh, three months, two and a half to three months, and I was working at home. At that time, I went back to working, or I was working much smaller and started working really, really intensely with, um, usually I work with just ink on paper, and I started working with a lot of color, oddly enough. So to go back to, I think what Rasna was saying about color, I think it's very true that when, you, when I was working in black and white, there was actually, I felt a lot of joy and a lot of emotion in those pieces. And when I started working a lot with color, it was more about closing in and becoming very private in my activity of making work and in my practice. And that's what happened when I was at home working, not in my studio. And when I got back into the studio a few months later, um, I continued working that way, but I had this need to work on canvas, something I'd rarely done. I've always mostly worked on paper. And to this day, I'm not sure why I did that, um, but I did. And I made, I started making most, these three pieces um, are results of those, of paintings that I did on paper um, and blew up and made larger. 
And they ended up, as I was making them, and it, it was over a period of a number of months, they ended up having these grids on them. And I thought they were grids, but they turned out to be um, really the, what you find in, and I always get this wrong, so I'm going to have to get the, the waif the waif and the weft, I think it's, it is in English. So I realized in doing them that um, they were actually about going in a micro way, microscopically, into fabric. And that was creating the grid. And that's what these were. So the fabric I'd worked with for many years, literally with fabric, was now what I was painting, but in a very microscopic way. And as I made them, they started opening up and falling apart. So the grid was actually opening up. Um, what else did I want to tell you about? Well, the, the other pieces uh, were these two pieces here. Well, the first piece, which is on the pamphlet and the entrance poster, um, were are referencing and were I was thinking about, especially this um, one, which is titled, and I always, I forget all my titles, so I have to go back on them. Um, oh yeah, Goya's, Goya's Dog by the Volcano. And it's a conflation of two things. It's um, a conflation of a figure, if you think of those of you who might know uh, Goya's uh, dog. It's, called, it's usually referred to as the dog, and it's kind of a dog with its head trying to reach out or going forward, but it looks like it's sinking. And um, somehow that figure, with all the blue and the, the beautifully patterned images there, um, turned out to be Goya's dog. Not quite sure. And it's got its hand in the volcano, and that's a reference to Malcolm Lowry's volcano. Don't ask me to go any further with that. I just know that that's what it's about. So if you read something else to it, all the better. <laughs> um, and what is really exciting to me to see in this show for, for my body of work is that finally the fabric works are actually related directly to the, to the paintings. And there's always been a connection with these pieces for me with all of my fabric pieces to painting. And this is, was a great opportunity, Charo, thank you again, for having that chance to, to actually put those pieces together. Um, go back to my notes. Um, and I guess finally, really all I, what I really want to point out is that the smaller works in the show are all as well revisiting the dress and the uniform and the tunic in its various ways, and its various forms. Um, but not unlike, actually not unlike Rasna, I also create works by bringing canvases and pieces of paper together. And that is another way for me where the line has always been a big part of my practice. Um, the line that's created when you bring things together, when you bring two canvases together, or you bring a piece of paper together, it's very much part of the work and it's another way of creating the line. And um, that line has been, in my work, in my practice, uh, a thread, um, and at times literally a thread in my work that connects my practice. And that's why in this exhibition, it was really exciting for me to be able to see that the line in its various iterations here with all the artists um, is a way and connects all of us together. And sometimes in a very abstract and sometimes in a very literal way, but it's very exciting for me to see that. So that's it. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight, and also thank you for um, staying to hear me talk. I know it's uh, difficult to stay stand up for an hour, so I'm going to keep it as um, quick as I can. So, my name is Azadeh Elmizadeh. I was born and raised in Tehran, Iran, and I moved to Canada in 2011. Um, I'm, I'm going to briefly talk about my working process and also uh, some of the visual motifs that I've been incorporating in these paintings. What do they mean for me personally and also as a collective? 
So my work in the studio evolves from a very slow process of layering uh, translucent glazes of oil paint on top of each other over a long period of time. I think of it as a meditative way of working. It takes between two to three months to finish a painting. And uh, because it's, it's time consuming work, I think it also requires uh, time to look at them. So I want the paintings to have a feeling of lightness uh, so you don't see much um, like heavy application of paint, but if you pay close attention, I hope if you pay close attention, you start seeing all these uh, thin veils of color woven into one another and also into the canvas. And um, I was going to talk about some of the visual references that I um, starting these paintings, you know, how, how do I start a painting, where do I, what is the departure point, and to me it's important to talk about those departure points because um, I, I work with uh, archival images, historical images, and those historical images are Persian manuscripts, and um, when I came here to Canada I had not much knowledge about Western art history, um, I mean, I had a very, um, on the surface, knowledge about art, art history, but um, not very in-depth. And I decided to educate myself. I went to OCAD to do my BFA, and then later I did my master's at uh, University of Guelph. But during all these times, uh, something didn't quite feel right. I kind of struggled to contextualize my work, and... I started thinking about these, you know, the language and the histories and the knowledges that I used to grow up with and the fact that how they've never been included in this uh, Eurocentric way of thinking about art and um, how I may actually don't need to contextualize my, my work within that dominant narrative. So, um, so that's why I think it's important for me to talk about those departure points. But the way I think about the work in the studio is actually very open. It's, it's as, uh, like open-ended uh, exploration or conversation with the materials and also the images that I'm intrigued by or uh, gravitated towards. So um, what else I was going to say, I, I work on many different surfaces all at the same time, both small and large. I mean, even though looking at the other paintings in this exhibition, I really don't think of these paintings as large anymore. But uh, this, is, this is the typical format that I usually work in, the portrait. And also, I still like to be able to um, hold the paintings in my hands so the, the width of the paintings is as large as my wingspan. And... Um, in terms of one of the reference images that I was going to specifically talk, talk about, I was going to talk about this painting titled Circling Around that is also on the invitation card. And um, the inspiration for this painting came from this painting by 16th century painter, Iranian painter Kamaleddin Behzad from School of Herat. And I was looking at his work and I was really interested in uh, this kind of vortex-like spatial composition that he repeatedly uses in his paintings. And, and in, this specific, in this specific painting, it was the movement of dancing figures around the circle within a vortex that really um, kind of intrigued me. And I was wondering how can I translate that into a painting and what does it mean, the vortex, the movement? And uh, I realized that it has a lot to do with, you know, this sense of becoming or change and transformation. And how can I translate that into a more embodied experience in these paintings? So in this specific painting, I, I borrowed that spatial composition of the vortex, of the movement, and as I was translating the figures onto the canvas, the figures uh, started transforming into these semi-figurative um, kind of cloth-like shapes 
that are not, as I said, fully figurative, but uh, may give the impression of a bodily gesture or presence of multiple figures um, dancing and circling around the circle. So that's the story about this painting. I, I started making these two paintings at the beginning of pandemic. By the time that I had my studio visit with Charo, and by the time that she uh, let me know about the exhibition, I, I had to move to Tehran because of a family situation, and, I, and my work had already transitioned into a more figurative stage. So those, uh, those two paintings at the end of the hall are from that time, the, one, uh, the ones that I started making in Tehran, and you can distinctly uh, recognize more figurative elements. And um, the transition happened when I was revisiting these archives of historical images of, of manuscripts and kind of thinking how they've always developed and evolved through and by the support of the private sphere of the court or the kingdom and how it's been always the will and power of the king that kind of uh, commissioned artists to work with certain mythological topics or epic narratives or stories around the life of the kings. And, and as I was looking at these images, I started recognizing these backdrop figures, you know, the figures that are not, that weren't necessarily engaging in any heroic acts, they weren't heroes or protagonists, but ordinary people who were engaging in collaborative acts of planting, sewing, weaving, even swimming, dancing together. And that kind of resonated a lot at that time and became the subject of this uh, new series of works that I'm currently working on that started from those two paintings. The painting on the right is titled Weaving Light. And the one on the left is uh, titled Sowing Seeds. And um, yeah, as I said, uh, there's a new body of work that I'm working on with the same subject. And I'm excited to share for an upcoming event in New York in September. So that's where I am now. I, as I said, I try to keep it as quick as possible. But let me know if you have any questions about specific works or um, or anything in general. Thank you. Thank you for listening.